Hi, this is Dan Gwynn with FrancisSchaeferStudies.org, and it's my privilege to bring you another installment of the Francis Schaefer Legacy Project. And I'm here with Jerem Bars, uh, and we're going to talk with him a little bit about uh, Francis Schaefer and Labrie and his life. Jerem, I have to tell you that uh, I've uh, long been an, an admirer, and uh, you've been a wonderful influence, uh, specifically on your lectures on Francis Schaefer. Um, we've listened, both of Jason and myself have taken a lot of time to listen to those and try to learn from you and learn from your experience of being right there in the midst of things mm -hmm. uh, during the uh, whole period of uh, the beginnings of Libri and the, the growth that came out of that. So at first I just want to thank you, but also um, uh, of late too, I've been reading um, your book, uh, Being Human, mm -hmm. that you wrote with uh, Randall McCulley, and I mm -hmm. really enjoy that as an admirer of Schaefer's True Spirituality book. Uh, it's really a, a significant work. And I'd like to talk to you about that one in, in a little bit. But I think I'd first like to start with your life and how things started with Labrie. So uh, uh, if you could maybe tell us uh, how you ended up at Labrie and how things gladly started. Do, I'm glad to do that, yes. Yeah, I, um, I went to university in Manchester in the north of England. Grew up in a non-Christian home. My father was a communist, basically. Mm -hmm. And I went off to university there up in the north of England. I grew up in the south and went with, with some very big questions about life. I'd worked as a gardener for a year between high school and college or grammar school and university, as they would say, as we would say in England. Yeah. And, uh, well, that might ex explain some of those uh, flower illustrations and garden illustrations that sometimes show up in your lectures. Oh, indeed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, uh, my dad worked as a gardener all his life. He yeah. was a wonderful, wonderful man, and my parents had, a, had just a, the best marriage I've ever seen. Yeah. So it was a very happy home to grow up in, very poor financially. But my dad worked as a gardener, on a local estate and he loved it so he taught us a lot about growing things and and then for a year between all the way from when I was 10 years old until I was 18 I worked every vacation Christmas summer and Easter mm -hmm. at the local manor house as a gardener yeah. um, and just to help the family's finances my parents didn't ask for help but I, I was giving them a good bit of what I was earning and then anything else where he was used for getting books and sports equipment and so on and uh, and then I took a year between between uh, school and and university to to work for the whole year so I was working just full time I had lots of time to think about what life is all about big questions and they really focused on three issues one is there any foundation for for human dignity all the wonderful aspects there are of who we are as human beings. Here I've grown up in this wonderful family with just this, my parents having just a beautiful marriage. They were great parents. We were poor, but there was lots of music all the time. And my dad read to us aloud every night. He read the Narnia stories. Oh, he certainly wasn't a Christian at that time in his life. And no, The Lord of the Rings, when it was first published in 1954-55, we got it from the local traveling library, and he read it aloud to us. And he just loved Tolkien, and so did we. But uh, that was my first question was, what's, is there a solid foundation for human dignity, for all these things we enjoy about human life, which are so special? The second was, is there a difference between good and evil? Is there a, a basis in the end in which we can say this is right and this is wrong? Or, or does it really not make any difference mm -hmm. in the end, how we live? And then thirdly, is there any explanation for the terrible suffering there is in the world? So I, I had those three questions which crystallized in my mind as I was working that year, and I went off to university to study English literature, which I love. Um, expecting to get answers to the questions and very quickly discovered I wasn't getting any answers at all from mm -hmm. my professors. Um, I was even ridiculed by one of them for for asking questions. I remember in an American literature class we w had read The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane and some of his poems which are very bleak. There's one in which he compares the universe to a a ship without a rudder that is just set loose on the sea mm. and 
that's what life is and we don't know where we're going we have no control over it there's no meaning to anything and I asked this professor well is, is he right is this the way life is and, and he just looked at me and he laughed he said what's your problem are you a nihilist you know as if this was something to joke about and, <laughs> and that was rapidly where I was coming and uh, so after just a few months there I began to feel life was completely absurd and ended up with the intention of, of committing suicide. Mm. I will, one day I, I sort of sorted all my affairs out and caught a bus out from Manchester where I was a student to a place called Alderley Edge out in Cheshire about 30 or 40 miles away where I heard there was a very high cliff and mm. went out there with the intention of jumping over it um, and just finishing everything and got out there was a cold day in January, it was must have been about 33, very cold but bright sunshine and I stood on the edge of this cliff ready to just jump over and I was absolutely overwhelmed with, with the beauty of, of, this, of the setting even in the middle of winter on such a cold day and I just felt like there has to be a reason why the world is so lovely and I, I've just got to keep searching it. I can't take such a final step just yet. And I went back in, and then a couple of days later, I met my first real Christian, Mm. who was a Canadian, who was doing his PhD in philosophy at Manchester there. And he had been profoundly influenced by Schaeffer, and had spent time at Libri in Switzerland, and he's still one of my dearest friends. I just spent a week with him in the Canadian Rockies last May, this past May, which was just lovely. His name's Michael, Michael Timshak. He's been a professor at the University of Saskatchewan there in Regina for many years. Mm. Just a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, he just was very kind and hospitable. And he, uh, the very, he, I, when I got to know him, um, he invited me to, he said, on Saturday nights we have discussion group. You know, sometimes we'll listen to a, a lecture on tape, sometimes we'll have discussion, sometimes I'll, I'll do a Bible study. Um, but We'd love you to come. So he, I went along, and he hadn't. I hadn't yet told him where I was coming from and how miserable I was. And that first evening, and it was God's wonderful providence. Without knowing where I was coming from, he read the first two chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Mm-hmm. So it's the preacher, and uh, just read these chapters out, and I just thought I had no idea the Bible had anything to say about what life was really like and this is this listening to my own heart and I was just astonished by it and uh, that that was in in the Bible and uh, I thought it was just fairy stories and completely nothing to do with real life at all and uh, on the basis of his reading that and then the discussion we had I started opening up to him and telling him what my questions were and he started answering those questions and he would play tapes by Schaefer on Saturday nights and we'd have discussions and so that was my first introduction to Schaefer mm. and then he invited Schaefer to come and speak at Manchester University there where I was a student so before I became a Christian the first time I met Schaefer was when he gave a lecture there one of his sort of overview histories of Western thought and culture in a couple of hours yeah. and I found it just astonishing it was like a kind of shining a bright light onto this landscape of things I was studying in literature um, and helping me understand what I was studying. I wasn't ready to become a Christian yet, but I could see that this actually made sense of of all the stuff I was reading. Mm. I was reading a lot of very bleak literature at the time, which was part of my course, like one of the worst books I've ever read in my life, Thomas Hardy's Jude the Obscure, which his wife begged him not to publish. It's so, so miserable. And uh, just a very, very sad, tragic story. <clears throat> and so Mike was answering my questions, um, and eventually I became a Christian one Tuesday evening in November 1966, um, on his kneeling on his kitchen floor, and uh, came to faith. And so that was just about six or seven months before I graduated. And when I graduated the next summer, something like June the 9th, 1967. Um, 
And my whole life was turned upside down by becoming a Christian. I was glad to be alive. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life yet, but uh, but uh, I talked to Michael. You know, what what, what do you think? Where, what am I going to do now? And he said, um, Why don't you spend a week or two at Libri in Switzerland? And so the day after graduation, I on graduation I hitchhiked down to my parents' home in the south of England near Winchester. And the next morning at eight o'clock in the morning, I set off hitchhiking to Libri from my parents' home. And uh, it was quite an amazing, uh, amazing journey because uh, I got stuck. After about an hour, I got stuck on a little side road just about 30 miles from my parents' home and was waiting there for about half an hour or so. And then this guy comes by in a little van and a little truck and a uh, sort of a closed van. Mm -hmm. And uh, he stopped and picked me up, and I was just trying to get back on a main road. But it turned out that uh, he was going to Vienna in Austria. Wow. Uh, and uh, it also turned out that he was a Christian. He was a student at Cambridge University. And he had just heard Schaefer speaking there just two or three weeks before. So he wow. knew about Schaefer, and he knew about Labrie. He knew where I was going. And uh, so I had a lift with him for two days. You know, the rest of that day, we went across the south of England to one of the ports and then got a, a ferry across to Belgium. And uh, then we drove and spent the first night in a youth hostel in Belgium. And uh, then the next day we drove all the way down from Belgium to Germany along the Rhine and stopped for the second night in Basel in Switzerland mm -hmm. in another youth hostel. And then he went off to Vienna and I hitchhiked up to Liberty. Uh, and I left home Thursday morning, and uh, I got to Waymo um, Thursday, Saturday morning, just before lunch, and uh, with one lift for most of the way, and then a few other shorter lifts to get me the rest of the way. But um, yeah, it was amazing. Providential. It was providential, and I, and I thought you, know, I was a very new Christian, very young, and I just thought, well, God really wants me to come to this place. <laughs> so there I was. I went originally for two weeks, but. Uh, very immediately became Edith Schaefer's gardener and then her cook mm -hmm. and uh, ended up staying there for a year meeting my wife um, who also arrived that summer she was Schaefer's secretary yes. and uh, we got met, we got engaged in October we met in September really started getting to know each other got engaged in October and married at Christmas and then we carried on working after our, our wedding with the Schaefers until the next summer, and then Schaefer sent me to come to the seminary and uh, to, to be a student there. And uh, then we went back to work in Libri afterwards when I graduated. Mm. So that's a, my story in brief, my acquaintance with Libri. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about uh, you know, your first impressions of Schaefer. I mean, you've heard, you heard uh, first on these uh, these tapes mm -hmm. and then uh, he came to speak I assume that these were those uh, those early kind of Bible studies in the flat of someone that was in, in uh, no these were lectures like um, I remember one of the lectures uh, was on that painting of of uh, Gauguin oh. you know what yeah. went swither mm -hmm. and so some paintings some lectures on modern art uh, on philosophy, on all sorts of things, on culture, some biblical studies, but mostly because Mike, my friend, was reaching out to non-Christians. I knew quite a few people who were converted through him during the time I got to know him. He's very hospitable, and very thoughtful. He's just a wonderful, godly man, and uh, and so he was mostly mostly playing sort of apologetic type lectures, you know, which were suitable for people like me who were believers and. Uh, and I remember one of one of them he 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 played was um, five problems of those who deny the Bible's evaluation of itself. You know, we're just mm. talking about archaeology and literary history and uh, literal history and so on, those kinds of issues. And uh, it was just I they, I just found it all wonderful, and you know, the Lord was using all of that to help bring me to faith. So mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, so that, that was the context in which I was converted. Yeah. And in terms of meeting Schaefer, obviously really getting to know him, when we worked in his home, when I worked in his home, I got to know them very well. 
Edith obviously very especially close because I was working as her cook. In my task every day I was charged by Frances to get her down to her office as quickly as possible because she was supposed to be working on the manuscript of the Libri story, right. uh, which she was writing that year uh, in 1967, the fall of 1967, and I guess it was probably published in 68. So, so uh, it's first uh, edition. But she was working on the manuscript, and uh, so I, my job was to get her down to her office and then to get on and prepare lunch for 10, 20, 15, 30 <laughs> people at the weekends, 80 people, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes 100 even for, for uh, supper on Saturday and tea on Sunday, lots of people. So, so lots of cooking. Yeah. So I got to know Edith and Francis very well in that setting, working in their home. It seems kind of um, amazing sometimes when I hear those sort of stories about 50, 100 people showing up at this house, you know, someplace in the, in the mountains, and how you guys uh, were able to provide uh, for that many people. Uh, how well, it was kind of challenging. You know, Saturday morning I would make bread for Edith, and you know, this was at a time when usually during the week there were 30, 40, maybe 50 people staying at the Brie. This was before the Swiss authorities set a limit on how many people could stay there, how many beds they could have. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the weekends, you'd sometimes have 80 to 100 coming up in the summer, especially. There were people who would just turn up for the weekend. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yes, it was very challenging in all kinds of ways. Obviously, in terms of the fundamental provision financially to buy all the food, you know, the Brie was, you know, the Sheikh was praying, and all of us who worked with them were praying that God would provide the finances for us. and just as it still does today. You know, the Brie was just functioning month by month on mm. the gifts that were coming in. I was the treasurer at the English Libri for many years and it was always astonishing to me to, you know, to see because we, we never had any big savings or any endowment. You know, we just, I paid the bills every month and we paid every bill that ever came. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes we didn't pay ourselves, but, uh, but we paid every external bill on time. I never paid a bill late all the years I worked as the treasurer. and So we prayed and God would provide uh, in all kinds of wonderful ways through some gifts that came regularly, others that were completely unexpected you know, where God had laid on somebody's heart to give. Um, and I remember the letters of some people who you know, just said, well, the, the Lord just, uh, I just felt the Lord encouraging me to, to send this to you and it might be $5, it might be $500 or Fifteen hundred, but uh, you know, though you get these very moving letters from people who you didn't know and have never met, and God had laid it on their hearts to give, and that was a wonderful, wonderful aspect of being the treasurer was seeing all those letters from people, and uh, just quite amazing. And uh, so we prayed, and God gave, and then we worked hard on the food. I mean, when I was Edith's cook, you know, Saturday mornings I was needing this huge amount of bread to make pizza for 50, 80, 100 people for, for dinner on Saturday evening and enough to make sweet rolls for Sunday or something like that for 30 people for breakfast on Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, it was, it was lots of work. It was lots of hard work doing, doing, the, doing the food preparation for, for that many people. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I'll know that um, Edith passed earlier this year and mm-hmm. around Easter and just, uh, I wanted to uh, your thoughts or memories of, of Edith um, yeah I had the privilege of preaching for a memorial service yes. in Rochester um, and uh, yeah my memories of Edith are just very precious let me just share one very personal one because this mm-hmm. kind of captures who who she is um, this was in October 1967 so I went there, arrived about June the 12th, something like that, uh, of that um, summer, and immediately started working for her just around the clock, and it really was around the clock. So, uh, you know, I would get up in the morning, and at seven I'd pick up bread from the village bakery there in Waymo and, and fetch the milk from the latery from, from uh, the milk place. 
and get it up there in time for breakfast and then prepare breakfast for however many people were going to be served breakfast that day and I'd often work till midnight and mm. uh, so it was, a, it was a challenging schedule because we had so many people and Edith worked hard and because I was working with her I was working very hard too and I mean one funny story is um, before I get to the other one which tells you more about her personally um, you know, we had I was also, you know, harvesting stuff from the garden for her because I, I love to grow things, and so we had so many vegetables. She decided to make relish to mm. serve with the uh, sloppy joes or the hot dogs or whatever we were making for all these people on Saturday evenings and for tea on Sundays. Mm. And so we made relish in the bath because there was so much, so many vegetables. We made eighty quarts of relish, and the only container big enough was. <laughs> was the bath, so we had to scrub out the bath and and then fill it up with chopped up cabbage and cucumbers and all sorts of all sorts of vegetables to make the relish and uh, but so that was a kind of funny memory that's typical of Edith too in a, in a way just uh, just using whatever comes to hand and uh, but it was perfectly good relish as well but uh, but this very per- very moving story uh, about her. Now, Edith is a matchmaker, she always was, and, uh, but our relationship happened so quickly that uh, we sort of got ahead of her, and uh, Vicky and I uh, getting to know each other and falling in love, and, and October the 20th is my birthday, I'll be 68 tomorrow, well, you know, that year was 1967, so uh, I was going to be 22, and... Uh, and uh, the, that day was a Thursday, uh, was my day off, uh, and Vicky's day off, and we decided to spend the day together. And I had been planning to ask Vicky to marry me that day, so I thought, my birthday, she'll have a harder time saying no. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I actually asked her the evening before. We went for a walk. Uh, there'd been a lecture or something on Wednesday evening, and we went for a walk on the Panay Road there. It was a beautiful moonlit night. I mean, the fall there in in the Swiss mountains is very lovely. And uh, so it was about 10.30 at night, and I thought, well, I'm not going to wait till tomorrow. I'm going to ask you this evening, will you marry me? And uh, she said yes. And uh, mm-hmm. so the next day, you know, we were going to just spend the day together. We didn't have our first formal date until after we were married. We went to see Gone with the Wind on our honeymoon in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. But uh, we'd spent lots of time together just walking around in the mountains there in the forests. So that was our closest thing to dates before we were married, but uh, we were going to spend this day taking a walk on the 20th on my birthday. Well, the day dawned absolutely beautiful. It was just a beautiful fall day. The colours were already turning up there in the mountains and reds and golds and oranges. And mm. When I turned up at breakfast that morning, it was my day off, but I was having breakfast there uh, up uh, at at Edith and Francis' home, she presented me with a little backpack in which she had packed a special picnic lunch for us. This was her contribution to what she thought was possibly a romance. (laughs) And she had stayed up all night making this picnic. And she had baked a little chicken, and she had made little sandwiches, and she made cookies and little cakes and packed little raisins and almonds and all sorts of things and little cloth tablecloth and cloth napkins and she presented this to me at breakfast and said you and Vicky have a nice day <laughs> this was her contribution to romance and uh, sure. and as I said she, she had been up all night you know, preparing it and that was just typical of her mm. and uh, we had a, just a wonderful day of course we walked about 12 miles and, uh, and uh, I had the greatest delight in telling her the next day that we were already engaged, got engaged the night before, <laughs> and that this was uh, her, 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 her wonderful picnic was a, a celebration of our engagement <laughs> rather than a contribution to the romance. So yeah. that's, but that's typical of, of Edith, of the kind of person she was and just how kind she could be and how thoughtful of other people and also her, her delight in encouraging romance. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you get a sense from the stories that they were... Um, both very giving uh, toward people, sometimes at their own expense uh, of, of time. 
And I recall from someone uh, saying that Schaefer told him very plainly, when it comes to people, we have to take the time. Mm -hmm. And um, how did how did you see that at work? I mean, there's, that's one illustration, obviously, with Edith, mm -hmm. the memories of Francis doing things like that. Yes, I mean, it, he, uh, I, when people ask me what about him most you know, struck you, impressed you, and I, I will always say his compassion for people. Um, and you would see it uh, in all kinds of ways. Um, he was prepared to, to spend hours and hours with people one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. You know, he, he would take long walks with people if the weather was fine, because he loved to hike, but he'd take people with him and talk to them. Um, you know, if it was raining, he'd sit and chat with them. Uh, you know, he was a man who who was in some ways shy, so he didn't find it all easy. You know, we'd prepare these meals for 20 or 30 people at lunchtime, and there'd be a discussion, and my wife would be upstairs doing dictation with him in the mornings, because he'd dictate almost every day a dozen letters or more, mm -hmm. and he'd expect the letters to go out the next day. She took shorthand as well as being a very good typist, and... Uh, and she, she would see him, how reluctant he was to come down. I mean, he didn't find it easy to face new people. Yeah. And there were always new people. Um, it is difficult. It's one of the most difficult parts of the work of the Brie, that you've constantly got new people in your home sitting at your table. Um, well, I, and I recall, too, in, the, in your uh, lectures on Schaefer, you mentioning at one time that there's just days you wake up and... You don't really feel like seeing another new face. Well, you, you don't, and he was like that, of course. But, you know, he'd, he'd get himself together and he'd go down. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then he'd just give himself to people. Uh, and I think it's important for people to know that it's not always easy to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't naturally uh, just this person who loved to be gregarious and just with lots of people all the time and constantly meeting new people. But he saw that as God's calling, and so he did it. Um, and it wasn't always easy, but he would come down and, of course, as soon as he, people started asking their questions, he would just get completely engaged. Mm -hmm. And you'd often see him weeping as people asked their questions, mm -hmm. um, just tears running down his face, because he just was very moved by people's hurts and struggles. And even sometimes when people would attack him, because obviously some of the people who came would, would come to attack Christianity, and Schaefer for being a fool, for being a Christian. But uh, rather than taking that personally or getting offended, you know, you'd see him weeping mm -hmm. for the person and trying to understand, you know, what was behind the questions in their heart rather than mm -hmm. treating them as aggression. Wow. And, uh, and so that was very moving. So you'd see his compassion for people in all kinds of ways like that over and over again. And... That was a very moving thing mm. to see that. And uh, he loved little children. That's another thing about him. I mean, just a, a personal story there. I remember this was when we were working at the English library when, uh, where our children were born, our three sons. And we were at the conference in Ashburnham, which he'd come over from Switzerland to speak at. That's in Sussex, in the south of England, just a, a little east of where the English library is. And uh, we had several conferences there in Ashburnham Place. It's a beautiful old house and huge grounds, thousands of acres of farmland. And, and uh, I was in this room before the conference started, uh, and two of my boys, who were then like three and two, came running in, Peter and Paul, our two older sons, and Philip was just a baby in arms at the time, but the older two came running in and and Schaefer looked at them and he said, whose are those beautiful children? You know, and I, and I just almost obviously swelled with pride to mine, you know, and, uh, and he just wept, you know, he just tears running down his eyes. Just he loved little children. And uh, in his essay, Secret of Power and the Enjoyment of the Lord, which was published in the Sunday School Times in, I guess, 1951, 52, something like that, he thought that was the most important thing he ever wrote. That's how he would refer to that. And he says in there that uh, you know, one of the marks of a great Christian is, 
is a tenderness towards little children. And it was certainly true of him. You know, he had this kind of soft spot for little kids. Mm. And you'd often see tears in his eyes when there were little children around. Wow. hear about um, Schaefer's compassion. I, I think that I've um, read a lot about Schaefer and a lot about uh, what the books say, mm. but hearing someone that personally encountered it is, mm. is very significant. Uh, one of the things that um, really has impacted me personally, I went through actually two periods of crisis in my own life. Mm. And the first crisis, a friend of mine gave me uh, How Shall We Then Live? Mm. And that helped out quite a bit, I mean, as far as uh, understanding uh, my worldview mm. and beginning to understand why we were in the place mm. we were, understand depravity and why people can mm. hurt others in the mm. way that they do. But I went through a period where, uh, with all the learning, it sort of made me a little bit arrogant, a little mm. bit prideful. And I swung back around and went, went through a different type of crisis and ended up encountering Schaefer's book, True Spirituality. Yes. And that hit me really to the core. Mm -hmm. And uh, between that book and The Mark of the Christian and a lot of counseling with my pastors, um, I was thoroughly transformed from the inside out armed with the, with the proper worldview, but also with the heart to yes. to deal with that and begin to uh, display the proper balance of truth mm -hmm. and love. And I know that um, you've written your book um, on being human, which I find very precious after true spirituality. I think that it's, it's, it lays things out in an even more extensive way and, and uh, puts it kind of in some modern phrasing. So I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of talk about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Share some of your thoughts on uh, the way the Schaefer's practice spirituality, mm. uh, the way it's impacted your life and your ministry. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I mean, I yeah, I'm quite aware. Obviously, there are there are many people who whose first um, interaction with the Schaefer's teaching and material was on the more sort of intellectual worldview kind of side. Mm -hmm. And especially in our reformed heritage, mm. where there is, we have such a wonderful treasury of doctrine and such a, a strong emphasis on on the life of the mind. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the errors that Christians can very easily make is that whatever God's most precious gifts to are, we can turn them into idols. Absolutely. and begin to be proud of ourselves and it's one of the tragedies of our reformed heritage we have this wonderful doctrine going all the way back to Calvin mm -hmm. and we can become very arrogant about it and start looking down at other Christians you know, we, we are the ones who believe in grace and we become <laughs> arrogant about being believing in grace rather than yeah. gracious <laughs> you know, which is a contradiction in terms Absolutely. and the same with where there's a, a, a great delight in the fact that you know, Christianity answers the question, so it's truth. We can become arrogant about that rather than mm -hmm. having compassion for people who don't have truth. Yeah. And th this is where the Schaefer's were, I don't want to use the word balance because that's, I, I think, not really helpful. But because it looks like you've got to kind of, difficult, with difficulty, hold on to both things because I don't think it is a matter of balance. I think it's just simply a matter of you're really paying attention to the whole of Scripture and understanding with our whole being what the truth is and so that we embrace it with our minds and we embrace it with our hearts and with our whole selves and if we do that's going to create humility because the very heart of any true relationship with God is humbling ourselves before him. Mm -hmm. and Paul says the man who thinks that he knows doesn't yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves is known by God and that knowledge by itself can puff us up. And so, so that is one of the, the problems. But with the Schaefer's, I think there, there, was, there was a beauty of a kind of reality which touched every aspect of life. Mm -hmm. And the heart of it for Francis Schaeffer was his own spiritual crisis you know, in the early 1950s where he went through this period of time where he saw 
you know, the damage caused by a kind of arrogant and self-righteous attitude towards biblical truth. Mm. Um, he was part of the separated movement himself. He saw how people became very proud of, of their holding on to the truth, very critical of other people, of fellow Christians, uh, as well as of unbelievers, uh, very power hungry, and he saw that there's terribly negative consequences, and he saw that they'd affected him as well, and so he went through this patch of several months where he said, if this is Christianity, I don't want to be a Christian. Mm. And he went back to the beginning himself to ask the question, is this really true? And yes, of course, he came out of it saying, yes, it is true. But he came out of it also with this very deep sense that of the heart of the Christian faith is the love for Christ and the love of Christ for us and dependence on him. And true spirituality came out of that period. It was the next year that he went to the States in the early 50s and gave those sermons, which were later put into true spirituality, yeah. um, because they were an expression of what he'd come to understand about the heart of one's relationship with God. And that little essay for the, from the Sunday School Times, The Secret of Power and the Enjoyment of the Lord, is the closest thing to that in terms of what he wrote about it, mm -hmm. of how he came out of that. And as he said himself, you know, at the end of that period, the sun came out again, and I was able to sing again. And, you know, he, he came out with a new delight in the gospel itself and in the love of Christ and with this passionate commitment to dependence on him. And it was out of that that they, the Schaeffers then made their statement, which basically governed what the Brie was going to be for all of its time to come, that at the heart of, of their life and at the heart of Labrie and at the heart of any Christian's life should be the commitment to be a demonstration in one's life that God is there and that Christianity is true and that that's to be expressed first in the life of prayer, mm. that we are worshipping a God who actually hears us and delights to answer our prayers and to meet our needs and that that ought to be evident in the life of any Christian, any individual, any couple, any family, that we're actually bringing our daily lives to the Lord and, and asking Him to come and meet us in our needs. So that prayer is the heart and the center of things, and that that should be expressed then in the second circle of a life which is lived out of gratitude to Christ, and where my life is going to display something of His compassion and grace and love and kindness to other people so that there's going to be some reality of community yeah. Schaefer was later to call an orthodoxy of community and then the third circle is this is the truth about all of life and therefore we ought to be able to think about any area of life and apply it to any area of life and we ought to be able to answer any question that comes up so the apologetic kind of answers which come with that but he saw these as all indissolubly wedded together. You know, this personal dependence on the Lord and gratitude to him, which is expressed in prayer and praise. And then this life, which is lived in love for other people, both believers and unbelievers. And then a life which has this passion for the truth. So he didn't see them as things that had to be sort of carefully balanced against each other, but as all indissolubly wedded together. You know, as a kind of you know, this, this, all these things, the, the life of the mind and the life of community flow out of this heart of, of dependence on the Lord and of love for the gospel. Mm -hmm. well, one thing that I think that, um, that, I've, that I've noticed um, looking at Schaefer's uh, view of really humanity, mm -hmm. um, it's, it seems like you know, the, the doctrine of uh, that relates to man being made in the image of God mm. had sort of it, it, it was like it's on the books but it's not really been being paid attention to yes. and then Schaefer seemed to elevate that yes. to a whole new level uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. I think that is one of the, the beautiful aspects of his of his teaching and Edith's teaching is this 
very deep sense of the significance of human persons. If you remember, that was one of my big questions as a non-Christian. Is there any foundation for human dignity? Mm-hmm. And what appears to be our distinctiveness? And the, the biblical answer to that is that we are made in the image of God. Mm-hmm. And so an emphasis on the image of God is at the heart of Schaeffer's apologetic. And it's also at the heart of, of his understanding of, of our calling in the world. You know, that that the image of God is at the heart of Calvin's understanding of the Christian being called to serve God in every aspect of life. You know, that we are to go out into the world as significant persons. You are made to love others and to serve others and to give all our gifts of significance and creativity and everything else to the glory of God and to the blessing of our neighbors. And so, you know, at the, the, this reformed doctrine of who we are as the image of God and the impact it has on apologetics and the impact it has on all of life is is you know very important to 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 the Schaeffers. And Schaeffer would often speak about the way he was very thankful for the teaching of, of Machen in this area on Christianity and culture, mm-hmm. which again is rooted in our understanding of human beings as the image of God, that part of being the image is the exercise of dominion, which is what produces human culture. Was fundamental to us. So yes, it's a very important aspect of his teaching. And then, of course, it then affects what he's going to say about abortion and infanticide and euthanasia and everything else. When Rand and I wrote Being Human, we were simply applying the doctrine of the image of God to the, to the spiritual life. How are, to we understand, how are we to understand spirituality? Well, spirituality is, is the a transformation into true humanness, into mm-hmm. being restored to the image of God. You know, it's not the denial of our humanity, not the replacement of ourselves with God or with the Holy Spirit or with Christ, but the renewal and transformation of ourselves. And that that's in Schaefer's teaching there, but we just simply took that and and expanded it. We one yeah. of the things around that I found when we were working on the book, it's there in Calvin too. Yeah. You know, that's the heart of his understanding of, of the doctrine of sanctification. Yeah. It's the restoration of the image of God. I think that's uh, it's a fantastic insight that a lot of people can very easily gloss over and not take seriously. Um, I, I, what in, impacts me is like what, what you say uh, about it, it, it affecting apologetic because it, it directs how that we uh, approach our fellow man. Mm-hmm. Yet at the same time, for us as Christians, the fact that we're created in the image of God also means that our sanctification process should be about that renewal. Yes. And uh, it's really about cooperating with the Holy Spirit. And it comes to mind uh, Schaefer's uh, phrase, uh, the creature glorified. Yes. You know, that it's modeled after the person of Christ. Yes. I hope that we can impart that to, mm. to people. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, and I think Jason wanted to ask too, is really about um, what do you th- uh, think the... the really the dominant message that we should uh, take away um, from Schaefer and from it really going forward I think mm-hmm. not just Schaefer but as as a church what should we be focusing on in, in this current climate because a, a lot of what I s- see Schaefer doing um, he always seems to come up with these really powerful phrases and, mm-hmm. and terms for his books that just hit the nail on the head about where you know mm-hmm. the problem is in culture the God who is there. It's, yes. it's has, it has apologetic value to an existential thought. You know? mm-hmm. it's, all these different phrases just seem yes. to stick out. So uh, if you could just share some, some of your thoughts on that. Uh, well, I don't think there's one thing. I think there are lots of things. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I found really unique, but which ought not to have been, because it's so important, was the Schaefer's emphasis on the terrible reality of the fall. And one of my lectures this morning I called the seven-pointed curse, which is an expansion of Schaefer's talking about the three-pointed curse in his commentary on Genesis, his lectures on Genesis in space and time. Okay. And I just expanded a little bit to, to just flesh it out, um, but I owe, I owe the idea to Schaefer completely. But uh, I think... Obviously, the guy became converted through Michael, 
because he was profoundly influenced by Schaeffer, he talked about the reality of the fall and the damage it's done to us, to who we are as the image of God, and as well as alienating us from God and us needing the, the, the redemptive work of Christ to restore us to fellowship with God. But one of the things I, I found very helpful about the Schaeffers, and which was missing in most churches to which I went, and is still missing in most churches, mm-hmm is there wasn't a sufficient understanding of the impact of the fall into all of life. And so what that meant was Christians giving very superficial answers, very shallow answers when somebody dies, Mm -hmm. when somebody gets cancer, to social problems, uh, to all kinds of situations. Um, And the Bible doesn't give us superficial answers. It's the only thing in in the world that explains the tragedy of human existence. Again, you remember this was one of my big questions as a non-Christian. You know, is there any explanation for the suffering in the world? And is there any answer to it? Well, Christianity is the only thing that has an explanation and the only thing that has an answer Mm -hmm. in the work of Christ and in the resurrection and the victory over death and evil ultimately and filling the world with justice and righteousness. So... So I think that that the Schaeffer's understanding of the reality of the fall was very profound. And I think it's still needed. Now, there are many other aspects of that teaching as well which which are still needed. But I would say that was an element of that teaching which one hardly ever heard anywhere else. And which was enormously helpful because it gave one a way of seeing the world and understanding the tragedy which is in everybody's life. It's one of the reasons why Schaefer was so compassionate to so many people in different kinds of areas because he understood very deeply the way our lives are broken. And so long before most Christians were dealing with issues of homosexuality, for example, you read Schaefer's letters and his volume of letters to people struggling with same-sex attraction and they're filled with kindness and compassion as well as holding to God's word because he understood understood that all of us are deeply impacted by the brokenness of the world and that can include having our sexuality messed up. And so he was able to speak about and write about such things because of his understanding of the breadth of the fall with with a depth of compassion. And that's where compassion is rooted in understanding both the dignity of people and the tragedy of people's lives. Mm. And and so many of the elements of the Schaeffer's ministry, which was so beautiful, were rooted in in that deep understanding of of the tragedy of the fall and the way it's impacted every aspect of life, and then the compassion that God shows to us in Christ, and the compassion we're called to show to one another. It's not like a wonderful tool to begin to speak to people, uh, to meet them where they are in their hearts. Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, it is with only Christianity has apologetic answers to the questions, Mm -hmm. but also Christianity gives us a foundation for really treating people with a kindness and gentleness and weeping with those who weep, as the scripture commands us (laughs) to. And that was the Schaeffers. They wept with those who wept. Mm -hmm. And that's our calling. And rather than just healing people's wounds lightly, which you, I'm afraid we often do as Christians, just saying, well, don't cry. God will take care of that. Mm-hmm. You know, which is true, of course, but that's not a sufficient answer. Or, you know, this will be resolved in the resurrection, which of, again is true, but Jesus actually wept at the grave of, at the grave of Lazarus, even though he was just going to raise him from the dead. And Schaefer talked about that passage in John over and over and over again, about Christ's tears at his friend's grave and his anger. Mm-hmm. And you know, that sense of the the tragedy of life and the appropriateness of tears and anger and resistance to evil was very much at the heart of their ministry and it's a very profound thing which uh, we all need to to pay attention to but there are many other things I could mention but that's one I'll pick on for you okay very Uh, good well I have to tell you it's been so wonderful talking with you well it's wonderful to talk to you it's uh, been a long time coming. I, I've wanted to sit down with you for a while, but wow. uh, I'm very thankful that we were afforded the time. Well, thank you. It's uh, just a pleasure to, to chat. Thanks for your questions.